fiber friends. About 10 years ago, I became aware of a certification program for hand spinners called the Certificate of Excellence or COE. And it is a program from HGA, which is Hand Weavers Guild of America. I first became aware of this program uh, while I was chatting in a Facebook group and I was talking to some spinners who really wanted to know that they were doing it right. In the United States, we don't have a body of knowledge to draw on other than what's being reinvented, rediscovered, reincorporated. And so as a new spinner, people want to know. Am I doing it right? Is this what I should learn next? What should I learn next? How do I go about this thing, hand spinning? And there's also another component to that, and it was part of the discussion in that Facebook group. And that component is, how do you know if someone is a good spinner or not? What do we judge them by? Should we judge them? What does it matter? Uh, someone mentioned the COE, and so I went to go check it out. I found this PDF on the uh, HGA website, still have this PDF, and I read through it until I got to the bottom of this PDF where I was absolutely screamed at <laughs> to follow, follow the, directions. the directions. To me, it looked like a very particular and fussy and very technical kind of an activity to accomplish and I wasn't in a place in my life that I could do that type of thing. I needed to, you know, have a time when I could just distance myself from the world and spend a lot of time cocooned in my home, spinning a lot of yarn. In 2020, the year of the great panini, I started my COE. If you look behind me there, you'll see all of this yarn that I spun for the COE. And I also have, um, they want it to be in a banker box. The yarn was in this banker box. And then I have this other one that's full of file folders and a binder full of written work and all kinds of stuff. It was a vast amount of spinning. If you took all of that yarn and tied it end to end, it would reach from the top of Mount Everest to sea level. It's a lot of yarn. I finished spinning. I packed everything up in a big box. I <sighs> wished them well, <laughs> my yarn children, and uh, sent them off. It was very nerve wracking to put on the insurance and tracking form, like, what is it worth? Oh no, we lost your box. How do we pay you back? Uh, give me three years. And uh, it went off to HTA, the headquarters, and then uh, there's a person there who takes my name off of it. I'm only referred to by a number. It gets sent to the judges. It gets judged anonymously. So they did not know who I was. They didn't know I had a YouTube channel or any of that. And so they judged it and it failed. I did not receive a certificate of excellence. I had a lot of feelings. <laughs> I don't care what the judges say. I still love all of you. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and then who's not consistent now? For a while, I was just sad and I really couldn't even spin anything to cheer me, cheer myself up. I just laid on the couch, watching Rick and Morty eating nothing but pickles for days. Wait a second. I made 57 videos about the COE, starting from the beginning. I can just go back to the first one and watch myself explain why I did this in the first place. The credential would be nice, like I said, 
but that's really truly not what I'm doing this for. I've always been studious. I, I like learning, and if something piques my interest, I delve into the re research like crazy, and I'll research and research until there's nothing left to read. And that's what, I, that's what I've always done with spinning. I love learning about the craft. There was something about it when I first started spinning. It was like something that I had always longed for, but that I didn't know existed. And when, when I finally started spinning, it clicked and it really satisfied something in me that needed that satisfaction that I can only get from spinning. That sounds a little wishy-washy, I guess, but that's, that's the best way that I can explain it. It soothes my soul. There's something about it. I also went through a really terrible dark time. I had a health condition that was misdiagnosed and my health was just deteriorating. It was horrible. And then I was also in a car accident resulting the, from those things. I've had several neck surgeries. Um, I was unable to continue my job as a elementary school principal and I really had to change and adjust a lot of things in my life due to my illness and injury. And one of the constants, besides my family, um, they're amazing, uh, but one of the constants, the things that I was able to continue doing was spinning. And I remember I was talking to a friend of mine at a fiber festival, a fellow spinner, and I was, I was telling her about how I was really feeling that spinning was helping me to heal in some really profound ways. And she said that spinning was the gift of my recovery. And I thought that was just the coolest thing. When I combine those two elements of uh, what has brought me to this place today, the combination of my desire to learn everything about the things that interest me and also my desire to honor this thing that has come of a terrible time, this beautiful blessing in my life that I have, that I enjoy so much, and that just brings me great joy to share with others. When I combine those two things together, this project makes a lot of sense for me. It makes a lot of sense to go through the process and also to share the journey. So here we are, that is my why. That is why I'm doing this, and that is why I want to create this whole series of videos. Winterland, tell me all your secrets. Fill me in on your wildest moments. Color trees, your yellow leaves move me. Dancing roofs, your painted red shakes the room.
Turn off the sky for me When you say I'll dig much deeper I will shout Let me know when I get closer Open up the sky for me When you say I'll dig much deeper I will shout La point did I lose sight of the original intention of doing this whole project? I'm not sure, but at some point I did start to maybe be a little hopeful that I could get a certification. It was so much work and when you get to the end of that much work, you just really want some kind of recognition for everything you've done. But that really truly was never what this whole thing was about. And those who were following the journey very closely know that along the way, I really was considering this video right now, this one that we're having um, at the end, which is a critique, I guess you could say, or a review, a very honest review. As a teacher, I wanna know, like, how is the grading system set up? I, I guess maybe there'll be points for certain sections or something, but I feel like there needs to be some kind of a rubric to explain how they, how they do their grading system. I don't know what they're grading on other than make good yarn. Only, what, 40 people? have gotten the, been awarded the COE since like 1980 or 81 or something? Is it even measuring spinning skills or is it measuring organization? Is the COE facilitating that within the spinning community? I have thought from the beginning that it's a very gatekeepy process. If you're not someone who has even just the luxury of the time to put into it, I don't know how I could do this if I was working a typical nine to five job with, you know, young children, just those kinds of, of requirements of time. This is so massive of an undertaking. I'm also curious to know uh, about the people who have been awarded the COE. Like there's so few people who have done this. Are they... Are they deliberately looking to ensure that we have a diversity of voices and backgrounds and, um, you know, is, is that, is that something they're concerned about? I'm concerned about that. What is the point of the COE? Is this even worth it? All of this, um, all of this work, this intense record keeping, <laughs> it's meaningless outside of the community. So I know that um, this is a strange kind of chat to have. These are all thoughts that I have in the background kind of always going on. <laughs> There's definitely some things that could be clarified. So is this a weird place to put my energy? Maybe. But I think anybody who can start spinning and approach spinning in a way that they feel empowered to make their own yarn I think that's important. I think we need more teachers. I think we need more YouTube channels, more festivals, more all of it. We need more. We need um, more attention on the handcrafts. And uh, if we don't have a way to create teachers with credentials who can be part of that conversation at that expertise level, um, if we're making it so hard to achieve that, then oh, we're just keeping all of the knowledge of it needlessly diminished as just a hobby. So the Hand Weavers Guild of America, HGA, 
did publish in their quarterly journal their strategic plan for 2022 through 2025. We are, at this point, less than a year away from 2025. Oh, that doesn't sound as exciting as I'm trying to make it sound. It's just not. <laughs> anyway, their strategic plan includes review, analyze, and refine the COE program. They did mention again that they will be reviewing the COE and that was in their end of the year in 2023 uh, sort of wrap up email things that are coming up that they are working on as an organization. So I really truly hope that if you are someone who is involved with HTA and you are watching this video, I really hope that some of the experiences that I had throughout this that I'll be sharing could inform you and help you to uh, make some of those changes and maybe review some of the ways that uh, this program is put together and hopefully make it better for future participants, judges, yourselves, all of that. Um, I really, truly, I'm here in good faith, so I hope that you will take this feedback to heart, not personally. I know that's hard to receive some feedback sometimes, but we can do this. We can all get through this together. I did when I read the score sheets. You can too. I also wanna make this video for anyone out there who has submitted a COE project that did not pass. I get it. And I also want to make this for anyone who might be currently working on a COE project. Um, you haven't finished it yet. Maybe you're considering trying it and you want to know what this whole thing is all about. Um, so this is also for you because I would like to provide some transparency and answer some questions maybe that I wish I had known the answers to when I started this whole process. For those of you who are my regular viewers, I know this is a little bit of a different video, but I hope you enjoy it just the same. Pull up a spinning project and maybe grab a cozy beverage, maybe a cat if you have one nearby. Uh, this is going to be a long video, um, but we'll get through it. And you might even see a little spinning. So hang tight for that. And I know that there's another group of people that might be watching this video. If you're here, not because you have ever spun yarn in your entire life, but you like to see people review stuff, especially people who are hyper fixated on their very particular interest, and they are going to share that with the internet. I see you, I know you're here, so grab your popcorn. And I also wanna give a huge shout out and thank you to my COE patrons. It has been a three year journey. I wasn't alone on that journey. I had many, um, many people following me and supporting me and uh, doing some of the spins along with me. And it, it's it been a ride. And I know that you're here as I am for a little bit of like closure, kind of putting a bookend on the project. Here is the end. We finished, we can take a deep breath and move on now. So we, um, yeah, this is for you too, especially for you. Just like any critique video, I'll do the YouTube thing and give all the disclaimers. So this video is based on my own opinions as someone who has participated in this program as a member of the fiber arts community and my professional opinion as a uh, teacher with an education degree. As part of earning an education degree, I took college level coursework about uh, designing and uh, evaluating effective assessments and what that looks like, how they work, all of that exciting stuff. So we will get into that. I also want to make it clear that I am specifically talking about the COE hand spinning program. I haven't done the other COE uh, certifications. This is specifically about hand spinning. I'm also not talking about any of the other programs that HGA does. I am not uh, talking about referring to or calling anyone out. Personally, I don't know any of these people. I have no relationship with anyone at HGA other than correspondence. So um, nothing is personal. The judges are going to remain anonymous. I know they didn't sign up to be in this video. <laughs> I might talk about some of the comments and things that they put on my papers, but I will absolutely be keeping them anonymous and confidential. I also want to uh, be very, very clear that anyone who has achieved the COE, they absolutely did earn it. They worked hard for it. They submitted 
a lot of work and they should be proud of that. And I, I hope they are. So um, this isn't about anyone who has received a COE. And one last disclaimer in the comment section. Um, again, none of this is personal and we're gonna keep things kind, uh, professional if you will. So I will be monitoring the comments and uh, don't be mean down there. You're welcome to disagree with me. Um, you're welcome to critique my critique. That's fair, we're having a conversation. Um, and if anybody wants to respond to this uh, video, you're welcome to quote me. I'm here to be part of the conversation to get this conversation started because I do think it's a long time coming. The screaming follow, follow the, direction. the direction. PDF is no longer on the HGA website. If you go to the COE program today, at the time I'm recording this, what you will find is a brief explanation of the program and you will find a couple links that you can go to to do a couple things. One is to purchase the handbook. It cost me after shipping and all of that, it was about $21 to purchase this handbook. It was mailed to me. Um, there's no digital option. It's just this physical copy. Um, so this is the program, this is the instructions. And then there's a couple other things that you can find there, which are uh, the list of COE recipients, people who have gotten their COE and what level, there's two levels in hand spinning. Um, I did level one, which is the technical skills. Level two is mastery and that's like a whole different project. Um, I won't be talking about that because I don't have experience with that. Um, right, so you can see who has earned a certificate and then there's another link for a uh, bibliography and it's a list of resources. Uh, put a pin in that one because we're coming back to it. Since I took a look at why I was doing this project in the first place, I think it's fair to take a look at the COE and why it says the COE is the COE. What are you up to COE? What is the point? All right, it has the aims listed on page five. The aims of the program are as follows to assist the individual by providing guidelines for evaluating his or her skills. Number two, to help guilds, study groups, and teachers by offering an educational program for study. Number three, to assist institutions and individuals to identify and locate technically qualified hand spinners. And number four, to encourage applicants to assemble materials that are useful in teaching the fiber arts and as references for further exploration. Whew. This handbook's doing quite a lot of work, isn't it? Those are some pretty big aims. I can start right off the bat and say that number four was absolutely successful. I have a huge library of yarns, of um, experiences, and references. I don't think I will ever uh, probably look at the written work ever again, but I do have all of those yarns, and so that is very valuable to me. Um, Number four, success. Speaking of success, let's take a look at number three and see who are the people who have received a COE. Let's identify these qualified, excellent hand spinners. At the time of recording, there are 38 people, 38 individuals who have received a certificate of excellence in hand spinning since 1980. This is one of those things whenever anyone brings up the COE among people who know what it is, they say, only 38 people have ever gotten it. Did you know that? Did you know that? To put that into perspective, there are more people who have orbited our planet in a spacecraft. In a single year, more people climb Mount Everest. More people have claimed to have spotted Bigfoot in New Jersey, allegedly. <laughs> that have gotten a COE. My point is, it's not a lot of people. I reached out to HGA with some questions that I had after I had received my results. I did inform them that I'm making this video and I let them know that when I asked these questions. One of the things I asked about is if they have a COE program impact report. Specifically, I wanted to know how many people submit a spinning COE project how many people are certified on their first try? 
how many people who don't succeed on the first try submit again, how many people have purchased a handbook that could give an idea of how many people are interested in the program. I'm sure there's many more people who are interested than actually desired to complete this much work when they realize how much it is. Um, what are the numbers? What's the impact report? The COE committee responded that HGA has the data of those who have and haven't passed the COE hand spinning examination. However, it's currently not in a format we can give out to the public. We are working on this, but at this time can't provide a completion date. Okay, so it sounds like they're working on it, but I don't have all the numbers at this time and I'm not sure when we will, uh, but I will work with the information that I do have. How did the COE get its start? When did the idea of examining members' work arise? The plan was really developed in response to craftspeople in those fields who wanted a system to provide guidelines for improving their work and by which their technical proficiency could be evaluated, whether for personal satisfaction or professional purposes. An HGA evaluation committee was formed and it was headed by Elsie Regensteiner. They went out into the fiber community and looked for criteria that skills could be evaluated against and they developed a certificate of excellence and at that time it was only in hand weaving. They wanted it however to include hand spinning and dyeing skills and so the handbook included requirements for primarily weaving but also required hand spinning and dyeing samples. The handbook was published in the magazine in the summer issue of 1975, and the first examination was held in 1976. And it included both technical skills and a specialized study. Each applicant submitted that material as a complete package. It's changed as hand spinning and dyeing became more of an interest within the fiber community, those programs were given their own handbook requirements. So HGA actually has four different categories for which we provide certificates of excellence. That's hand weaving, hand spinning, basket making, and dyeing. Each has their own individual handbook. The COE in hand spinning has existed for about 40 years, so I made a visual chart. <laughs> I guess all charts are usually visual. Um, and I broke down the number of recipients per decade since it's been 40 years, we have four decades, and I eliminated the level two recipients. This is just level one. And I noticed something when I took a look at this chart. What happened in 2000? Okay, besides all that, what was going on with the COE in 2000? I want to give us just a moment to put our mindset into the year 2000 um, because I don't think it's fair to proceed with this whole video without looking at what things were like at that time. So here we go. In this spinoff magazine article from 1998, I found this article explaining how to join a fiber arts listserv. If you're too young to know what a listserv is, was, I don't know, do they still exist? Uh, basically, your name would be on an email list and whenever anybody asked a question or wrote up some information, it would just get sent out to everyone on the list. So you'd have lots of emails to look forward to. This was pre-social media. This was also pre-blogs. That didn't exist yet. But let's spend a moment here and let's take a look at the clip out mail in order form for the back issues and this fricky ad. Oh my goodness. Look at the bottom here. To get a copy of their current catalog, you can call them, mail them, fax them, or email them. There are so many options. It's kind of like how in the current COE handbook under written materials, it says all written materials of more than a sentence in length must be typewritten or computer generated. You're also in some sections allowed to neatly hand print. So 
We have so many options. I got a typewriter because <laughs> I couldn't help myself. A couple years later, around 2004 was it? Facebook appeared on the scene, and during this time in the early 2000s, this was the heyday of the RSS feeds. Everybody had a blog, and I think that that probably did have some impact on the COE because rather than having to take an exam to get on a list that HGA would distribute, your body of work, your display of your skills it was laid out for anyone to look at. It was on your blog, and that stuff was now suddenly searchable. But there's something else that happened in the year 2000. HGA revised the handbook. As a teacher, if I suddenly had a large number of students failing to pass an assessment that previously lots of students were passing, I would be taking a very good look at those changes. Um, to see what was going on. Uh, again, I don't have those numbers. That's just an example of something that I might do in a classroom if I had a parallel similar experience, but I don't have those numbers. So I don't know if uh, people were still, uh, you know, submitting and a fewer number of them were successful at that time. Or if, like I said, the internet, things were changing. And uh, so it's possible that less people were submitting. Hopefully HGA will have that at some point for us to take a look at. And if I was in that classroom uh, with an assessment that I was taking a look at, there are a few things that I would specifically look at in that assessment. One of the things that I would take a look at is if uh, several students were of the same skill level and they all submitted their test to me to grade, I would want to make sure that they were all receiving equal grades for similar work at the same level. And the other thing that would be very important is if uh, one student, say, came and had me assess them and then they went to another teacher for that assessment and then another teacher for that assessment, would they get the same score within a reasonable margin of error uh, from each teacher? That's very important to make sure that there is consistency. Just looking at my own COE project, I noticed that there were a few skeins where the judges came back with very different scores. And so I was curious about that because I'm not sure what the discrepancy was or uh, what one judge was looking at that the other, maybe they missed something, I'm not sure. That is probably something I would take a look at um, to make sure that all the judges are on the same page. And, and we're gonna come back to that, so let's put a pin in that. I think that another thing uh, really to look at with the COE is if someone submits their work and some of their skeins of yarn receive a passing score, and some of theirs don't, and overall they didn't pass, and so they get their work back and they uh, they resubmit. So they s redo all of the work that didn't have a passing grade or score, and then they resubmit everything. The ones that passed the first time, will they for sure pass the second time that they are submitted? They should, right? Because um, there should be consistency. If they pass, they pass, and it shouldn't matter which judge which year. Um, so if anyone has personal experience they'd like to share about that, I would be very interested to know. I did find someone's uh, written experience about the COE in an article in Spinoff Magazine. Um, I want to give uh, Long Thread Media a shout out because all of these are digitized and if you have a subscription, you can access their library of all of the back issues of Spinoff. It's a lot of fun, a little time, time capsule. <laughs> you can kind of journey through time and look at some of these things to make you nostalgic. Um, but you can also find some really good articles because there's a lot of spinning information that is still very valid and it. it's very useful. Uh, so this is what I found. This article was written by Jude Durrell, uh, sharing her experience with the COE. She holds a level one and level two, 
And for level one, she did submit it twice. She failed the first time and redid it and was successful the second time. In the article, she writes that on the second try at level one, I was successful. The second set of judges praised the same schemes which the earlier judges had criticized. Uh, She had redone the documentation, meaning the tags that explain why she chose the uh, fiber that she used and some other information about the skin she rewrote. um, And then the same yarn was successful. And she believes that's because the judges had a better understanding of the choices she made because she had redone the documentation to be more clear. Uh, She writes that she was preparing her uh, COE under level one under the original guidelines. Um, I thought this part was interesting. She said that uh, some of the changes, each skein now needs to be only one ounce, not two. As a result, it is no longer necessary to destroy one's hands trying to complete the program in a reasonable amount of time. We are going to talk about that in a moment. She praises the COE program very much throughout this article and uh, had a tough time when she didn't pass the first level, but overall in the end was very grateful for the experience she had and uh, the knowledge she gained from doing the COE. Uh, She says also in this article though, uh, there can be no set standards for achieving it because in the spinning community, we are constantly growing. What was excellent eight or 10 years ago would not be excellent today. Um, And then I found it interesting because underneath that, there's an editor's note from the editor of this issue. And it says, in our experience, standards for achievement of the COE have been extremely high throughout its history. The difficulty comes in attempting to convey in written guidelines what level of work is sufficient and in a lack of standards for judging, which has left the judges in each round with the responsibility of developing their own standards. Both of these problems have been addressed in recent years, and only future participants in the program will be able to determine whether more work in this area needs to be done. And I think that at this time, it is appropriate with HGA uh, reviewing the COE program. I think it's very appropriate that we do take a look and make sure that how this assessment is written and implemented, that it has consistency and also transparency in the area of how these projects are judged. What happens if the judges have a question about how something is submitted? What do they do? They did mention with the 2000s uh, revision that they uh, sort of standardized like the language and the processes and all of that between all of the COE exams. Um, And so I think when we're talking about the judging procedures, it would be probably the same in spindle shuttle die pot. Uh, it says as the examiners review the work, a guild member serves as a scribe. And so that person is there to kind of assist them and write things down, take notes, all of that. And it says, if a question arises during the exam, the scribe may do a quick internet search for the examiner. I have questions. I'm trying to give as much benefit of the doubt to this whole process. And I just, I think that it's fair to share my thoughts and my opinions on all of this. And I I don't think that the judges doing a quick internet search in the middle of judging um, is something that makes me feel like the assessment is going to be very reliable. I mean, maybe the judges are watching my YouTube videos to get their answers, right? Uh, No, because I haven't earned a COE. How would they know that my information is valid? Who is going to vet me to make sure that I know what I'm talking about and that I'm giving responses that are going to be the information that they need to judge someone else? Like... Where is the standard on that? Who decides? The internet decides? I don't know. I'm just not sure I personally feel comfortable with that uh, process, in my opinion. I also have a question about how they are going to ensure that the information that they are looking up in their quick search, how will they ensure that it's not generated by AI? 
and that it is actually written by a hand spinner who has hands who has spun yarn. It's getting harder and harder to tell. It really truly is. The judges are people who have earned a COE. They're people who are requested to do the judging by HGA. Um, and so I'm not implying that the judges don't know what they're doing or that they aren't at a level above the applicant who is submitting their work. But I do know that, you know, as craftspeople, we kind of all fall into that thing that we're really into, right? And so one of the judges might be really into wool and another judge might be really into flax and not vice versa. And the more time since they've done their COE, you know, are they still remembering flax and maybe they look something up or they ask a question to verify a vocabulary word or something like that. You know, I mean, that's reasonable, but I just have questions about where, um, where that information is coming from. The next question has to be, is this assessment doing what it says it's doing? Is the, is the COE assessing hand spinners the, and uh, getting their knowledge the way it says it is? I couldn't get my hands on a copy of the previous COE uh, to see what may have caused this drastic change with that year 2000 revision. Um, I couldn't get my hands on one. I was in high school at the time. I did find this article that explains what the changes were. The first section was changed from uh, fiber study to design principles. And when I, you know, when I opened that up, I thought, okay, good. You know, probably spinners should understand surface design and that kind of stuff to uh, design their yarn. But the more I got into the write-up for this section, it's all just, it's all writing. The more I got into it, the more I was, honestly, I was, I was confused by this. And the reason I'm confused by it is that I don't understand the point, honestly. I don't. And now I, I, I know that sounds like my opinion, but I have some reasons why I don't understand the point. Let me tell you a little story about a guy named Benjamin Bloom. Benjamin Bloom was an educational psychologist at the University of Chicago. He was the chair of a committee of educators. And at that time, these educators were trying to understand how people learn. They created a hierarchy of levels of understanding intended to improve communication between educators. It's like the foundation of most traditional education systems and it's used to structure learning objectives and assessments. Okay, so let's come back to what I was about to explain with level one, design. The COE is hand spinning. It's technical skills in hand spinning. So if we look at Bloom's taxonomy, the, it's, it's shaped like a pyramid because you have to have the stuff at the bottom before you can get to the stuff at the top. If you don't understand the definitions of things, you know, you're not going to get much further than that, right? So section one, design principles, it says to define in sentence form each of the following terms, and then it has a list of terms, texture, rhythm, balance, proportion, um, etc. It wants you to discuss in separate paragraphs how those incorporated into design of yarn or other things like weaving, knitting, crocheting, and lace making. It's a lot of stuff in the hand spinning uh, COE, but anyway, it wants color definitions. They want you to write a definition of hue, value, chroma, um, etc. Present a short explanation of the following color schemes, monochromatic, analogous, etc., etc. So, and then there's some more um, things about like discuss how to determine the amount of twist per inch and its relation to twist angle. So it's it's just a lot of defining things and a very base level explanation of things. And that is at the bottom of the pyramid. And if we are assessing excellence in technique, I really think that we should be assessing things that are a little further up the hierarchy. I have to know all this stuff to get there. That's why it's at the bottom of the hierarchy. 
So it might be worth taking a look at that. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff where, you know, describe how the hand spinner determines how much yarn to spin, um, how size and finish size varies from fiber among yarn styles, all of that kind of stuff you uh, discuss. Um, so I just want to say that I'm calling this out in particular detail because I really think that HGA needs to take a look at this because if it's at the bottom of that hierarchy, that means that our large language learning models, AI, is going to be able to produce that work. If an AI can do it, how is me showing you that I can do it demonstrating my excellence in a handcraft? I really gen genuinely have questions about that. Another thing they added with the revision is a series of charts. Now, I understand the idea behind this. I really do. Uh, these are just tables that are meant to be filled in. And so like, for example, table two is protein fibers and they want to know what animal it comes from, what the micron range is, the fiber lengths and structure and elasticity, all of these different things. It goes on, uh, felting potential. And then they list a bunch of protein fibers like alpaca, angora, camel down. Uh, they also have another one for cotton, different kinds of cotton. They have one for uh, breeds of sheep, a variety of breeds of sheep. I understand that, you know, as, as we talked about to give some context about what the internet was like at this time, I understand that the idea of a teacher a spinning teacher having a chart that they can quickly reference that has all of this information would be so valuable and so important. I don't think that you could go online and find all of this stuff in one place. But I have to say that filling out these charts 
felt incredibly tedious and incredibly redundant. And I did not feel like it was examining my skills as a spinner. It was, uh, it wasn't providing me with a chart that I'm ever going to reference ever again, probably ever, I can't imagine it. Um, and there's a major reason why that is. We have new resources now <laughs> that are very important resources that we can use as references. I really think that most spinners who ask what books should I get, this is at the top of pretty much everyone's list. The Fleece and Fiber Source book covers it all. They've got all of the stats on even more breeds for sure than um, the little chart that's in the, in the COE and covers all of these different animals as well and silk and even more references and all of this stuff. It's such an important resource for the fiber community. I found it interesting that uh, Deborah Robson, who is one of the authors of the Fleece and Fiber Source book, was asked a question and she shared her answers on her blog. She was asked if she would ever complete the COE. And uh, she said no for various reasons. One of the things that she mentioned, I personally found very interesting. She said that she wasn't interested for one, her body of work, oh my gosh, speaks for itself. Like she really doesn't need a certification. She's the author of the Fleece and Fiber source book. Like all of the samples and swatches in here, who spun all that, right? She doesn't need to do all this to prove that she's got skills. But the thing that she also talked about was that she has quite a lot of projects, articles, um, other things that she's doing within the community. And for her to take the time to complete a COE submission would take her out of being able to do all of these other things within the spinning community. And I find that personally for myself, this was absolutely a project that prevented me from doing some of the things I wanted to do just because of the amount of time that it takes to do this. If I didn't have the support of my patrons and if I didn't turn this into a, you know, something I was offering to other people, if it was just me spinning this all on my own, that's a lot of solitary time where I'm not in the community networking, building relationships, teaching in front of people, getting experience teaching. Uh, it, you know, it, it really removes you from the fiber arts community to get all of this work done. And so I definitely think uh, that was a good point. But back to it, right? We have these references and resources now that make some of these requirements obsolete. I don't need charts. I have the fleece and fiber source book. That someone asked about bibliographies. I I know we were are working on those. I'm not sure if they're ready for publication yet. Well, we do have uh, uh, bibliographies on the website. Some have been revised, not all of them. Um, and I would ask you when you look at the bibliographies um, to these are. Uh, references that might be useful in your study. You are not required <laughs> to use all of the books that are referenced in these materials, but it gives you an idea of books that have information in them that might prove to be useful, that you may not know anything about. So it's just another tool that you can use as you expand your knowledge going through the handbook requirements. An assessment also needs to reflect the cur uh, curriculum that it's paired with, based off of, right? And the thing about the COE is that it is not a curriculum. It is sort of an outline of self-study. They don't tell you how to do any of the things that are in the COE. They just say that they want to see this thing performed and submitted. So it's up to you to go and, you know, take workshops, read books, find a YouTube channel that you like, like and subscribe. I have to say the YouTube things, forgive me. Um, <laughs> so 
what they give the applicant to reference is a bibliography. It's like whenever you're with spinners um, in the community and the COE comes up, the, these are the things that people discuss, uh, that so few people have gotten a COE, that it is an incredible amount of work, that the instructions, the handbook is very particular and confusing. Um, maybe not that one as much because you'd have to have the handbook to see it. And the bibliography is out of date. <laughs> Those are the three things I heard over and over and over again when I told people that I was working on a COE submission. <laughs> Those three. You can get to the bibliography without buying the handbook. And so people get a view of what the bibliography is. And right now we are going to play a terrible, terrible library game. Are you ready? Take a look at this picture. Now take a look at this picture. Which picture represents the COE bibliography? Did you guess? Yeah it's out of date. It really needs to be updated. I think when there are questions that arise about the COE, there's sort of like a reframing that happens for the things that haven't been addressed yet. And the kind of reframing is that it's no longer a bibliography. It has been changed to be a um, COE suggested sources, formerly known as prints bibliographies. So the bibliography being out of date is a big concern to a lot of people who are taking a look at the COE. And I wanna talk about this because I really think that HTA needs to understand why. So I hope that maybe one person could have watched at least this part. When you don't have the handbook and you're looking for a program of study, you look to the sources because the sources are what builds the framework, right? If this is a course of self-study, it's gotta be based on that bibliography. And if that bibliography is incredibly out of date, doesn't that mean that the COE program is out of date? It's a reasonable assumption that someone could make if all they saw was the bibliography. I asked this question in my Discord about should bibliographies be kept current and why? And uh, the thing that was very much the consensus is that the bibliography should be a living document. And the content of the bibliography reflects the content upon which the criteria are chosen and what the course is designed to assess. I completely agree. I think that there's a lot of reasons to keep the bibliography up to date. New technology comes on the scene. I had a question about e-spinners at the beginning of this because there are no e-spinners mentioned anywhere in the handbook. And there was a time when e-spinners were becoming more popular that some people had the opinion that e-spinners were not real hand spinning. I think we've had this conversation and determined that yes, we spin with our hands and that's why it's called hand spinning and not foot spinning. It doesn't matter if there's a treadle or not. Um, but you know, I mean, these things do change over time and we have different conversations. There are fads that, you know, maybe the fad gets incorporated into the assessment and maybe it shouldn't be there anymore. Um, available materials change over time. I mean, this book right here um, talks about minerals. You know what mineral is? Asbestos. It is a mineral you can spin. Vocabulary changes. Some things are referred to differently in different books at different times. Outdated ideas are removed. As an example, take a look at this book cover. Tell me that you didn't read the book and went ahead and painted a cover for the editor anyway without telling me you didn't read the book. There's an accessibility issue with keeping the bibliography up to date um, as when things are out of print, they are very expensive because the used bookseller out of print economy on Amazon is wild. Also, some of the old books are 
uncomfortable. And by uncomfortable, I mean they're a little bit racist. Moving right along, let's take a moment to recognize that HGA is mostly run on volunteer labor. And I'm sure that updating a bibliography is not at the top of their list to spend that very valuable time of these people who have offered their time to volunteer. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure the bibliography is not at the top of the list of things that need to get done. I'm sure there's more that needs to get done than there are people to do it. So I would like to offer for HGA um, and also for just the community, let's create a living bibliography. Let's, um, I'll make a Google Doc and I will put the link for it in the description of this video. And you can go there and if you have a book that is in your library that helped you, that you enjoy, that you appreciate, that you think has good information, you know, go to a citation generator, put the stuff in, get that citation and pop it into our bibliography. And we will help HGA get their bibliography updated because I know that they're asked about it a lot. So let's help them out with a minute of volunteer work. And then if you need a good source of uh, spinning books and stuff to read, you know where to go. Something that I'm really happy to see in the HGA uh, vision statement, also their mission statements, you know, all of their stuff. I'm really, really glad to see that they have statements that they are seeking to have more diversity and inclusion in their, in their programs, in um, their guilds, all of these things. I'm really excited to see that. So let's take a moment and talk about DEI in the COE program. One of the pieces of equipment that's required to uh, spin some yarn with for submission is a large supported spindle. And what they mean by that is a Navajo spindle. I spawn Navajo churro sheep with my large supported spindle and you know, that, that was great, that was fine, but uh, just kind of continuing a little thread from that bibliography, it would be really nice if we are going to have people spinning um, using techniques and methods that are specific to a culture and a heritage. It would be really great to see some people of that culture and heritage informing the standards for how that is going to be assessed. And also probably to have people of that community um, providing some of the reference material. When I put a charka in the write-up about the uh, wheel-driven spindle, one of the judges said it was notable that I included the charka. And I wasn't quite sure how to interpret that. I didn't really understand if that meant that most people don't talk about it, um, or if they were like, good job, you did it. You got it. The thing we look for to make sure everyone includes. I don't know. I'll just leave that out there. I'm ultimately, I'm not sure that I am <laughs> specifically the person to be uh, making an issue of that, but I did want to bring it up. The requirement for the equipment, uh, it just wanted a brief description of how you use the equipment and then it wanted the yarn spun. And I think that perhaps it might be more valuable to eliminate the definition stuff in the beginning and maybe include a part where the applicant has a chance to expand on the context of that equipment. Um, maybe that would be an opportunity for them to do some research and to learn, um, learn. That's the point, right? We're all learning. I thought that would be cool and I thought that would be more inclusive also, especially if someone is doing the COE who has come from a different culture than just kind of general American spinning hobbies. So again, I might not be the right person to be, you know, talking about all of the nuances of this, 
but I do want to make sure that there is space for that included in this conversation because I definitely think it's important. And um, I hope that if people uh, do talk about that, they would be listened to and respected for um, their lived experience in those areas. Let's talk about gender. When you submit your COE, it is completely anonymous. You are assigned a number and then the judges only know you by that number. There's only one person who knows who you are. Until now, everybody knows who I am. <laughs> they just know your number. Um, and so it's completely anonymous. And I do think that is a good thing. I, I think that can help prevent um, unintentional bias or things like that. So I do think it's a good thing. Um, that, that it's kept anonymous, but every time I was referred to by people who only knew me by my number, I was referred to as she, her. Now those are my pronouns, but there are people in my community who have followed this journey with me and they're not she, her. And so if they did submit a COE project and all the stuff that came back to them, like the documents, like the signed documents, were just she all over the place, um, that would be uncomfortable for them. And the way that the handbook <laughs> says his or her all over the place, like we can use they as a gender neutral singular pronoun. It's okay, we don't have to say his or her, we can say they, it has been in use in that function, in a non-gendered singular pronoun, in the English language, in common usage, written work, dictionary reference, since the 12th century, it's not new, it's not hard, and it is inclusive. And I think that we can all do that. Um, I think with the update, that should absolutely be something that is, uh, you know, just addressed with the judges, for who they communicate to, if it's anonymous, they don't know, and uh, update that language in the handbook for sure. I also had a question that was discussed frequently within my community about what reasonable accommodations and adaptations does HGA have in place for the COE should someone need them. I don't know. I do think these are good questions to ask maybe. Um, for the people redesigning or whatever they're doing to consider, you know, what if someone doesn't have the use of their legs? Um, and, you know, there's so much work to do with a treadle. Can it all be done by e-spinner, for instance? Or maybe someone has an allergy to alpaca or an allergy to wool. Is there a is there an alternate method for them to be able to participate in this program? I don't know. It's just something I'm putting out there. It was definitely discussed in my community and we did definitely wonder, especially particularly about the allergy issue and about the uh, use of legs, treadle, walking wheel, about that uh, also. So it's a thing to discuss. It's important. The COE is expensive. It costs $300 to submit a COE project, and that does not include the cost of the equipment that is required to do certain spins and all of the materials. It's expensive, and it feels to me, in my opinion, that when you're not left with clarification on the rules, you get to a point where you just have to say this, I'll find out. And you submit it and you'll find out. Um, and then you submit it again to pass. And it wasn't because you couldn't spin to a standard. It's because you were unclear about how to submit, about what to write about about these things that could be um, better communicated in the handbook. And maybe if it is a regular thing to submit it twice, that could be communicated through um, like an impact statement or something that would just say this many people submit twice so that people could budget. Because $300 is not a small amount of money. 
Um, you know, perhaps I know that HGA has scholarship programs and perhaps there could be something in that, in that, um, you know, I, I don't know. That's up to HGA to decide. I don't know their budget, but I do think that the cost of this program could be prohibitive to some people. I personally could not have submitted this project for the COE if it wasn't for my patrons um, who supported me doing this. And they got the benefit of the videos and seeing a lot of tutorials, demonstrations, and hopefully it was interesting and entertaining. Uh, but without them, I wouldn't have had the disposable income to do this kind of a project. And I just think that there, there could be some ways to mitigate that. I don't know. I don't know because I, I'm not responsible for the budget. But again, these are some things that came up that were discussed in my community that I wanted to mention. If anyone is considering doing the COE, it takes not just money and uh, finances, it takes time. There were so many times that I was in the middle of a spin and it took me away from some of my household responsibilities and Mark did the dishes for me or did, you know, clean the bathroom or cook dinner when it was, you know, my turn to cook dinner. Like we're really equal with the chores. So when he starts doing more chores because I can't because I'm doing work stuff that has to get like there's a there's a there's a cost there as well. And it's not a small amount of work and it's not a small amount of money to participate in this program. Does it assess what it says it's going to assess? Let's get back into that. It took me three years to complete all of this work. And I can tell you that some of the spins, the judges absolutely loved. One of the judges says, said they were shining gems and I, I really appreciated that comment. Um, and a lot of those were the skeins that I spun towards the end of those three years. My spinning has really changed. It's come a long way. And the problem is I can't give a snapshot of my current hand spinning skills. They are going to get a smear of my skills over the last three years. Um, some people took eight, 10 years to complete a COE project. I can say that the spinning, I jumped in way over my head because uh, I happened to come across some money and um, decided that would be enough to buy all the fibers. And I did the spinning part one in uh, nine months, but I did work at it as if it was a 40 hour job. So uh, I, there was no break in my, uh, in my work effort. It was extremely um, time consuming. I do know one person who said it took her probably more than 10 years because she started um, and her, ch her children were little and so she got just so far and then life got too crazy and so then she put it away and then when she finally came to the end, she um, and she submitted, she said she thought about going back and starting all over again, but she decided that she was gonna look at it like taking her driver's exam. And if she flunked, she would register again and fix the ones that she knew needed some help. And she did pass and that was great. But I think she said it was something like 12 years <laughs> from start to finish. I mean, this is a skill that you practice and it changes as you practice. I'm not sure why your practice work is being submitted for evaluation. Um, it seems like the practice work should be done and then you should have a submission. But if it takes so long to do the submission, then you're gonna end up sending in your practice work. Does that make sense? Are people following me here? So I think there's something really simple that they could do that would make it less tedious work and it wouldn't change any of the criteria or anything, anything like that. And all they would have to do, they've changed the quantity before. They went from two ounces to one ounce. Good. What if we had one ounce or a hundred yards, right? Because there are some yarns like this one that doesn't have quite so many yards. And then there are some yarns like this one. And this one took me months to accomplish.
And some of these I could complete in an afternoon. If you know how to spin, I think that your spinning is going to be your spinning from the beginning to the end of the skein. And I don't think you need that much work to evaluate if someone has hand spinning skills. I also have some questions about why there's such an emphasis put on writing labels. It talks about organization for a good first chunk. All these pages are before we even get into <laughs> the requirements for the spinning. I mean, that's a lot. And it's, it's just organization, how to present the project. So I think if you just dive into the book and you're confronted with this page after page after of, of how to submit, it definitely gives the impression that they're grading your submission based on following the rules and how you organize more than the spinning itself. And with a project this size, I understand that it just needs to be very clear and very obvious to the person sending it in, but also the people receiving it so that they can grade it efficiently. Uh, they're not making money on this endeavor and they do bring people in to judge the project. So having everything laid out in an easy to follow fashion so that none of it gets confused or mixed up, I think that makes sense but it specifically wants it to be on index cards. Well, I don't understand why it has to be an index card because it gets put in the folder like this, right? So why does that have to be an index card? Because they also keep referring to typewritten and I'm like, friends, friends, it's 2022 now. We can print this stuff. It doesn't have to be an index card but my printer won't print index cards, so I'd have to special order that to have them all printed, which at this point I'm actually considering it because who wants to write applicant number, swatch number, associated skein number, construction technique used, and then suggested end use on 40 plus index cards? Because I was thinking I could just write them all out and then have them ready to go. Well, now I realize why I didn't do that in the first place. That sucks. These little tags, they want to be two inches by five inches. Most cardstock is going to be eight and a half by 11. 11, meaning that we have three cut, or we have two cuts for three pieces, right? Because we can't just cut once down the middle because it's not five and a half inches, it's five inches. And so I have to take an inch off the end and then cut the other in half. So like, am I being too, am I assuming they're gonna be that picky? But like, why can't it be five and a half inches and just cut it once down the middle? That makes more sense. But then also, who wants to cut out 40 tags? I don't, I just, I'd rather spend my time spinning, honestly. The important thing is to follow the directions, not to say to yourself, yeah, I might like to do it. Uh, yeah, I know it says that, but I'm gonna do it this way and just do it that way, which might be better, but it's not following the directions. And if you don't follow the directions, the judges can't give you credit. <laughs> it's a huge part of this handbook. I'm sorry, this is notorious. I understand that the the there needs to be a particular instruction about how to submit it because it's a, so much work. It's a lot of work to go through projects of this size. It takes all day. And sometimes the judges try to put two in a day. They travel to do this. They might not even be at their home. So I understand that they can't spend all day trying to decipher someone's very creative presentational organization that they made up, right? I get it that they need to be clear and specify how these things are going to be turned in, but we do have some tools now that could make it easier for everyone all around. If they want the tags to be a certain way, there could be a PDF template that you just print out and then it just has the tags. You cut them out and then maybe you have more time for spinning and not measuring and cutting out tiny tags that don't equally fit on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, leaving leftovers.
follow, follow the, directions. the directions. So read the instructions. Don't try to interpret them. Do what they say. When they say spinner's choice, <laughs> it's kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, I get to do something that I'm very comfortable showing off in terms of skills. And on the other hand, What are they looking for? What do they want from me? <laughs> Instead of it, whatever this is, because it just doesn't quite make sense to me. And I have frustrations, but that's okay, because I'm gonna work through it. I'm gonna make my best guess, my best assumption at what they're looking for. Um, <laughs> I get that. Uh, but I think they need to rewrite these instructions. They're just a little confusing. And I'm not exactly sure where it says type of fiber, where it says fiber and then type of fiber. And I, I saw some people talking about the results that they had gotten, people who have done the COE and published their results from it. And uh, the, I guess, judges were a little picky about what they considered cellulose fibers. Um, they didn't want rayon, even though that's a cellulose fiber. But uh, because of that, I, I'm now I'm like synthetic fibers. What are they looking for? What is the synthetic they want to see? I don't know. I mean, there could be someone judging this who's a super ankle weaver and looks at this and says, oh my gosh, why on earth did she do overhead knots on the end of that band? It looks so ugly now. That's horrendous. Let's take all the points away. These are just my anxieties, but <laughs> they're real. <laughs> the special effect yarns are a little bit mysterious. If you look up some of the other projects that have been done, some of the responses people have talked about, <laughs> the special effect thing is one that a lot of spinners are like, define that. What makes it special effect? And the answer is kind of, you'll know it when you see it. And everyone's kind of like, we need a little more clarification. I figured I just need to spin something and I need to justify it. That That's probably the main thing that they're gonna be looking for. I, I don't know, really. This one had me stumped, so I thought, you know what? I'm gonna do a whole bunch of ounces and this will be the one that I'll make my swatch from. <laughs> Why not? I thought, you know, if I can make a swatch and it looks good, then it'll be evidence that I did it right. I hope so. I hope I'm doing this one right. Is this what they're looking for? Is this what they expect? And so we'll see how that process goes. Um, I'll let you know. Maybe? <laughs> That's a little confusing. And sometimes I wonder if they put those things in there like it's kind of like, are they gonna pick the appropriate technique and choice and thing? But then also I feel like they are asking for a little bit of mind reading because it's not quite clear. This is one of those things where I am not sure exactly what they're looking for. It says texture, but there's a point where having so much texture can actually start to affect um, whether or not you're getting all the wraps per inch you need. So uh, texture is different than uneven spinning, if that makes sense. So I'm, I'm trying to keep it even with texture. I don't know. This is one of those that starts to make me question like what I think is texture. Is that what they think is texture? <laughs> I guess we'll find out. So if you are confused about the handbook and what things are, um, they provide a mentor. This is a person who is very skilled and is volunteering their time to participate in this program and I am grateful to them. We are not calling people out by name or any of that. Um, this is specifically about the program and the way that they are providing this, not the mentor personally. Very clear, right? So it says that um, the mentor is a knowledgeable volunteer, right? Whose role is advisory only. Applicants and prospective applicants may accept or disregard the mentor's counsel. 
Uh, since the mentor is not involved in the evaluation process, of inquiry will not affect the evaluation of the applicant's work in any way. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that they stated that. It shouldn't, you sh for asking questions. Anyway, um, here's another explanation of the function of the mentor. So we provide um, a mentor, which essentially assists individual is in trying to understand what exactly the handbook requirements are asking. It's not a mentor to help to answer your questions. It's a mentor to help you understand what the requirements are for the handbook. I think we need to do a little bit of a case study and discuss a couple of the spins that I did in particular. One of the reasons that I wasn't sure which type of core spin to do, what they were looking for, um, is that a soft core spun yarn is rarely a balanced yarn. And that's okay. That is part of the character of this yarn design. You can do things to minimize it, but it's a single that's twisting with fluff wrapping around it. It's not, you know, there, there's nothing to remove the twist. And so you can finagle that, but it's not balanced. Why would it matter if it's balanced? That is a feature of that yarn. So on page 12, we are going to read the directions. It says, uh, each skein must exhibit the same amount of twist throughout the skein unless otherwise specified. Plied yarns should exhibit balance in the ply. All the plied yarns should be balanced. And remember, we are doing a core spun yarn in the plied section. This is section G, which is plying. So it has to be balanced because following the directions, it says balanced yarn. Plied yarns are balanced. Is a soft coarse spun yarn a plied yarn? I think of it as kind of a singles. I kind of think of it as just like a constructed yarn. Am I out of line thinking that a soft coarse spun yarn is not a plied yarn? Well, I went searching to see if anyone agreed with me and it turns out a fellow Jillian, <laughs> Jillian Marino, agrees with me. In her book, Yarn Atecture, also published after the revision. She explains the process of core spinning and she says, attach your core to your leader and spin the core and the fiber that will wrap around the core as a singles yarn. Singles yarn specifically is going to be a single that is left as a single and it is not plied. Soft core spun yarn is not a plied yarn. So that must mean that because this is in the plied section, they're looking for the other kind of ply, right? The kind where you have a single for plying wrapping around a core. Well, I took a look at Andrea Longo's successful COE project, which she has generously shared on her blog. She has pictures of all of her spins, the breakdown of what she did for the spin, the comments from the judges, and then her response to uh, whatever comments she received. And so I took a look at her skein number 38, and uh, here's what it looks like. She did the coiled type of course spin, a logical choice as we've kind of really <sighs> laid out here. And I think she spun a really lovely yarn and she goes in to explain how she constructed it and the reference that she used for designing this yarn. The responses she got from the examiners were examiner number one saying that it isn't the definition of a core spun yarn and examiner number two saying it was hard to tell if it was a core spun yarn at all. Andrea's comments about this say, I don't understand why this is not acceptable core spun yarn. I tried several different designs based on what I found in Spinning Designer Yarns, a book that has been out a while and is entirely about making novelty yarn. And she says that she doesn't um, understand the inconsistent comment. Some is thicker, some is thinner. It's designed that way. And I have to say that I agree with her. Her yarn should be perfectly acceptable under the requirement. We have several books that document that that is a correspond construction. Arguably, 
more appropriate than my soft core spun yarn because as I said, this is not applied yarn and this skein is in the plying section. In the end, obviously, I went with the soft core spun. Here are the comments I got. One judge thought it was a lovely combination of color and texture. And the other judge I had noticed that there was some um, size and twist variation, basically that it's inconsistent in diameter. Which again, if we go to page 12, it says that each skein must have an appropriate surface texture, consistent diameter. Every skein has to have a consistent diameter. Every skein. Why? Why must every skein have a consistent diameter? Um, but this is a special effect yarn. What does special effect mean? Can a special effect yarn be thick and thin? Can it pull twist in some areas and have less twist in thicker areas intentionally as part of the design? Slubs are a perfectly valid design choice for some yarns. But then also under section G, it says the size and texture of the yarn is at the discretion of the spinner. So did I lose points for my inconsistent yarn? because on page 12 it says that all yarns have to be consistent, but then on section G it says the size and texture of the yarn is at the discretion of the spinner. And I have no way to actually know if I did lose points for the inconsistency. The only thing I can maybe assume is that I did because of the judge's comment, but there is no breakdown of the points for anything. We are going to come back to that. You're probably feeling like I'm getting really tedious about this. I agree. I am being very tedious about this. And yes, I signed up for this. Um, but back to my original intention, I signed up for this because I wanted this to be something that would benefit the community. And HGA's, their mission statement is that they, they want to inspire and support the, the fiber art community. That they provide resources and, and this is supposed to be something that is beneficial for the fiber arts community. So we have a lot more to talk about. I'm not going to go into this super tedious detail about every skein of yarn, but I, I think you're getting my point. We are gonna look at one more for a specific reason, but I think you're getting my point that Interpreting the directions is not as straightforward as HGA seems to think it is when you ask questions and the only response you get is follow the directions, read the directions, the directions, the directions. <clears throat> so let's take a look at a special effect yarn next. This is skein 39, so it's the it's the skein that comes right after the core spun one. We are still in the plying section. 39 says, special effect yarn, either singles or plied. If singles are allowed, why is it in the plying section? Okay. Featuring the amount of twist as a design factor. All right, so they are specifically saying that the amount of twist is a design factor. So that has to mean that page 12 won't apply. Page 12 that says, except where the directions state otherwise or where they leave it to the discretion of the spinner. And I will remind you that this is a double up, right? Because in the directions for the section, not uh, section G plying, it says, that uh, the size and texture of the yarn is at the discretion of the spinner. And then we go to yarn 39 and it says special effect yarn, singles are plied featuring the amount of twist as a design factor. So this is all at the discretion of the spinner. We're very clear on that. It's up to the spinner. This is the yarn I spun. Now this is the other kind of core spun yarn where the the yarn is wrapping around the core that's held straight at the wheel. But this is a coils yarn. If you have ever spun a coils yarn, you know that those things get super twisty. Super, super twisty. Um, and this isn't that twisty. So, let me tell you, because I'm, I'm really proud of this yarn. I love this yarn. 
So then I was thinking, what if I started looking at yarn designs that had inconsistent amounts of twist throughout, and that led me to a slub yarn. Because when we create a poofy slub in the yarn, we are making a thick spot, right? So we're drafting out a, a slub intentionally so that it doesn't gain any twist because it's too thick and the twist will accumulate in the thinner spots. And those thinner spots are on either side of the slub. And those spots stay thin, accumulate the most twist, and then we can have another slub intentionally that doesn't get it doesn't have as much twist, right? So we've got high twist, low twist, high twist, low twist. So I thought maybe that could be a fun kind of a yarn to uh, create. And then, because this is the plying section, they want that to be plied, the most fun to have with a yarn like that is to ply it onto another uh, whatever. It could be a core, it could be you know, some other single or something that is spun. And um, although this one does say it could be singles, but like it's in the plying section. Why would you put it in the plying section and then say it could be singles? I don't know. So I'm a little bit kind of <laughs> on this one, but uh, a slub yarn like that, when it is spun sort of in a super coils kind of way, then it creates a very stable yarn and it can be a really cool textured effect where it's got sort of the coils that are nice and thick and then it thins down a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna do two singles that are Z-twist and then I'm gonna apply those together also Z-twist. Then I'll have one strand and I won't have to manage two strands with the chunky texture strand coming at it. I'll have one strand that's plied, it'll just be really super overspun the wrong way. And then we'll go the correct way, which will take that twist out, but because there's so much twist, it'll give me that twist I need to bring in those chunky uh, slubs and spiral them up. I think that's the solution for making this yarn 100% hand spun. And oh my goodness, if they take any points off of this yarn, for being weird or whatever, <laughs> I will go print myself a certificate. <laughs>look at what the judges said. One of the judges said that the spirals are not evenly distributed. Why do the coils have to be evenly distributed? I don't understand. Is this a special effect yarn or not? Is it at the discretion of the spinner or not? I cannot have been the only spinner attempting this who has been very confused, possibly asking for clarification on these things. And the only response back is to read the directions like, okay, I have to stop here because there are different ways to interpret these directions. You have directions that uh, directly affect each other on page 25 and on page 12, like in very different places, different sections even, um, that still apply because it says all the yarns. You've got plied yarns being referenced on page 12, but the section isn't until page 25. There's a lot of stuff here that I interpreted one way and uh, they were looking for something different. I think that the core spun yarn is a good example of how there are multiple ways to approach that and they're not wrong and there are references to prove that and yet it's it's judged based on stuff that just 
it feels like you need to submit the project once, get the feedback, and then you'll understand what you're supposed to do, and then you can submit it again so that you can pass. That's a lot of work to have clarification on the instructions, and this is what it feels like. It feels like HGA says, dress like a penguin for the party, and you ask them to clarify, and they say it's clearly stated, follow the directions, dress like a penguin for the party. So you do. But HGA doesn't want Oswald Cobblepot, and the only way you can figure that out is to show up dressed like Oswald Cobblepot, feel super awkward, and then the next time that we have the penguin party, dress like the other penguin. Neither penguin is wrong if you say dress like a penguin. In my opinion, I think that if there is something that people are frequently confused about, that the judges possibly need help interpreting, that the applicants might need help interpreting, that there is a mentor, um, not to teach spinning skills, but to help the applicants understand the directions, I think that maybe um, the problem isn't with, with us. <laughs> maybe the problem is with the handbook. Maybe the directions are convoluted, confusing, spread apart in different places, even though it applies to the same thing. Blanket statements that don't make any sense. Vocabulary that's used that's not defined, that's used in unusual ways. Special effect yarn. What is a special effect yarn? What qualifies as a special effect yarn? What characteristics does it have? I don't know of a standardized understanding of special effect yarn in the fiber arts community. So if they want to refer to skeins as that, they need to define what they mean by that. Everyone's confused about that. It's time to talk about the rubric. Um, I could get into the weeds on this because I really enjoy designing rubrics. Like, I think it's fun. I'm a weirdo. If you're still here, you already know that. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at this rubric. Um, in the handbook, here's what it says about uh, criteria on page 18. It says criteria for evaluation of level one. We have completeness of all required work, mastery of techniques, technical execution and skill, suitability of materials to technique, effective use of color or fiber, effective design applications, finishing, compliance with size and weight requirements, and general appearance and neatness. The question I wrote them was, the COE is a criterion referenced performance assessment, meaning that the applicant is judged based on how well they meet a list of criteria. How are the standards for the COE criteria defined? So they say the criteria for evaluation of the written work in parts one and two and the technical samples in part three are detailed in the handbook for the applicant. They are also incorporated into the score sheets as a reference and reminder for the examiners during the examination process. Some of the criteria are given more weight in the evaluation process than other criteria. For example, for the technical, uh, technical schemes, completeness of all required work, mastery of technique, technical ex execution and skill, and suitability of materials to technique would have greater weight than effective use of color or fiber, effective design applications and finishing, followed by compliance with size and weight requirements and general appearance and neatness. The criteria seem clear and self-explanatory. This is gonna to bring together a couple of the things that we have um, discussed up till now. So, we have a fundamental misunderstanding uh, between the COE board and uh, my question, which was like, the criteria are here, the criteria are in the handbook, but what are the standards? How do you define the standards? And they said the criteria are in the handbook. They basically told me to <laughs> read the handbook, <laughs> follow the directions. Um, 
there has to be a better way. Criteria and standards are different, um, but they function together. A criterion explains what they're looking for while the standard explains the different degrees of competence one reaches in that particular criterion. Good rubric is going to define the degrees to which the person is meeting those criteria and it is going to give examples of what that would look like to communicate both to the judges and to the applicant. This is an example of what a rubric should look like and uh, how standards should be defined. The standard needs to be defined as, at the very least, we need to have the, you know, awesome, this is what we wanna see, this is excellence, and then the didn't meet that criteria and it needs to be defined for every single, every single one. And the reason it needs to be defined is so that the judges can look at it and they all know what they're looking for. Um, for instance, if a yarn is a special effect yarn and different people have different interpretations of what that means, like are the bobbles evenly spaced, that would be defining a criteria, right? So if, if the criteria is, you know, incorporates design and, uh, it says design a special effect yarn, including uh, textural components such as slubs or baubles or, you know, then like evenly spaced could be on there as part of this is a good job. But that also has to be communicated to the applicant so that they know what they're being tested for and what a good job looks like. <laughs> the, the knitters, um, the Knitter's Mastery Program, they do that. They show examples of work. There's no examples of COE work, what looks like a, uh, you know, a passing project, like a good job. They're so very secretive. In all of the materials, it talks about being so anonymous with uh, people who don't succeed and get their certificate. It talks about during the judging, if the if the project doesn't pass, it's like packed away and the person is never mentioned. It's, it's a very dramatic way of explaining that, but it, to me, in my opinion, I perceive that as feeling like they want to protect the person from shame somehow. That's just kind of the vibe I get in my opinion. I don't know if that's accurate, but why? Why? You know, I mean, if the person didn't make it and they don't want to be publicly known that they weren't successful, anonymously use pictures of their work to say, here is a picture of yarn that does not meet the standard that we are looking for, for excellence in spinning this XYZ type of yarn, right? That's your criteria and that's your standard. Show people what you're looking for. It's also going to help the judges not have to look on the internet for things because everything will be defined, clarified, examples are there, what something good looks like, what something doesn't, go you know, that isn't good looks like and how many points each thing gets. You'll be able to ahead of time lay out the points to make sure that technical skills are receiving more points than neatness. Somewhere out there on the internet, someone who judges the hand weaving component mentioned that they don't like to see machine sewn seams. They want to see everything um, hand finished and that's like their thing. If there's a rubric and, and they inform the committee writing up that rubric, you know, maybe that could be added as like exceeds expectations or something. But if it's not listed as the standard, then it cannot lose points because it's not, it's not there. It's not being graded. It's not defined. It's not the thing that says you're meeting that criteria. It makes the assessment objective. It takes away subjectivity. It makes it faster to grade because you don't have so much decision fatigue. You're not trying to figure out everything on the fly every single time that you're grading something. Um, 
it gives really good feedback to the applicant because they're gonna see exactly what they were lacking. Is someone consistently using the wrong technique with the material that they chose because all of their points were lost in that, in that you know, criteria? And they would know it because it would say, this is how we know it's suitable versus not suitable. Here's where this could really matter. Back to the penguin party. So number seven is finishing. A lot of my yarns, I thought, well, they probably want to see that if I'm spinning something, I know how it should be finished. So if it was a worsted spin, I snapped it. If it was a woolen spin, I thwacked it. If I wanted for some surface texture to have, you know, a halo or something, you know, I, I did the things that it needed to be finished in that way, but one of my judges seemed to want everything in like a presentation display kind of finishing, blocking, which means that you're gonna pull it all straight and steam it, which makes it so that it's harder to see the energy in the yarn, which is actually gonna hide a lot more things. I don't know, maybe that would have gotten me <laughs> It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have to be clear. But if that standard is defined and, the, and we have appropriate finishing, um, <laughs> then it's gonna say, you know, accept, chooses an acceptable finish that correlates with the type of spinning, um, you know, or things like that and then give some examples if all the yarn has to be spun even or you know with consistency what is the range of acceptable um, variation in a single that is true woolen spun like English long draw with double drafting that is not gonna be as consistent as a worsted yarn because that type of woolen spinning, the consistency comes when you ply it. And if you're asking only for the single to be submitted, what, to what degree can that have variation versus that worsted yarn that should have far less variation in it? You know, what is the standard to say this is consistent? Does it have to be exactly completely you know, even all the way through, because that's not realistic for true woolen spun long draw submitted as singles. So like, how is that defined? There needs to be transparency on these things and it needs to be written down somewhere where everyone can see it so that the judges have clarity and don't need to look on the internet. And so that um, the applicant knows what they are looking for in the submission. You can't not define the standards for which you are evaluating the applicant to see if they have met that criteria. <laughs> this is how assessments work. I'm going really hard on this, but if you know, if you want to have an assessment and say that you know, this is a very serious thing and it carries a lot of weight in the community and it shows a high level of degree of technical skill and you're asking people to submit projects with an extraordinary care to detail and um, following, you know, the directions. It's unfair to then assess that with an unequal level of technicality, particularly when these things are not opinion, that these are like best practices in how to de design and create assessments. I really think that there needs to be someone who understands how those things work on whatever um, task force is evaluating this, uh, there really needs to be someone who um, understands how to create effective assessments that are uh, reliable, that are have validity, you know, that are transparent, current, and the full rubric needs to be in the handbook for the applicant to see it. A lot of this 
felt much less like I had the opportunity to explain my spinning knowledge and show off my best work. I found myself second guessing and frequently getting myself up and not saying, is this what they're looking for? But it could be this. Maybe this is what they're looking for. All of these things are true. You know, it was just, um, if I wasn't doing it for my patrons, I probably would not have finished it <laughs> because it started to feel a little pointless. Um, there was a study that was done. A bunch of people were taken uh, and told they would get a whole bunch of money if they dug a hole in the ground and that was their job for the day. And so they dug the hole and they got a whole bunch of money. And at the end of the day, they were told to fill in the hole before they left. And then the next day they got a little bit more money, but they had to dig this hole all day and then they had to fill it back in at the end. Um, and so even though they were being offered more money over time, people were quitting because if people don't see a value in the thing that they are being asked to do, it doesn't matter what the reward is. You are going to burn those people out. They're going to quit and move on. I was really burned out doing this. And again, if it wasn't for my Patreon community, I wouldn't have made it through. Um, it was grueling. And I really don't think it has to be. There are so many simple ways that so much of this could be, you know, modernized, I guess. <laughs> like for all the little tags, give a PDF printout. It prints out, you cut it up, you fill it in, and then it's consistent. You know, um, defining the standards for the rubric so everybody gets to look at it and be on the same page with how it's being graded, how you're defining these things. What is HGA looking for in a excellent hand spinner? Like, what, is that, what does that mean? Obviously, it has to be more than just, you know, twisting some fiber. But, like, what is the measure of that? You know, is it that someone could sit down at a spinning wheel, be handed an ounce of fiber, and then spin the entire thing to a specifically requested yards per pound within a yard margin of error? Is that the standard? It'd be really cool if everyone could do that. I mean, I'm sure some people throughout history could do that, but is that the standard? Is that what makes a spinner excellent? Is spinning a usable yarn that is visually appealing, that is finished in a technique that correlates with the draft, that uh, you know has a certain margin of consistency for the twist, right? Like defining these things matters. <laughs> I've harped on this enough. I think everyone gets the point. I know that there are teachers watching this right now that are uh, just internally cringing at the fact that people have done this much work for an assessment that does not define its standards. Because, um, <laughs> let's bring this all back around to, um, community. If we want to be seen as excellent in our craft and to be taken seriously, I know it's frustrating that we would have to fight for recognition in ways that, you know, an athlete doesn't have to, but culturally that's where we're at. Textiles are undervalued. And if we want to be taken seriously, we need to treat ourselves seriously. And I really think that part of that includes having useful assessments that can give people certifications, that can recognize their skills. There should be outreach and networking and promotion of our skills and our crafts. Teachers and those in the skill who have achieved a high level, you know, it, what if we had some social opportunities to hang out and chat with each other other than, you know, the final dinner at a festival and 
share information with each other, share things that work. What are some good ways to teach someone who's struggling with this particular thing? Why do we want each teacher to reinvent that when we are in danger of losing hand spinning one generation and it's gone again? We need to be promoting more excellence in our craft and we need to come to some kind of consensus in some way as to what that looks like and the different ways that we can approach recognizing people. I don't think that certificates should ever be the only way that becomes very gatekeepy. I don't think it should be that. Um, but I think there should be options. There are different things that people may want to have as their form of recognition, depending on what their goals are within the community, outside the community. Um, and I feel like we don't have enough of that. And I feel like the COE, you know, there's just a lot of people now who, you know, the post Panini internet has changed and there are a lot of people who can, I mean, anybody could, you can just start a website and you can say, I have a course. And if you take my course, you will get this certificate. You can print out your own certificate. You can design and make your own certificate. It's so easy to do that. Why is that worthless when the COE is not, right? The thing that makes it valuable, right, is its reputation. The community has to say, yeah, that's a valuable thing. We understand what went into earning that and achieving that. And so that has value. And we have, you know, a reliability that it's a valid test. And there's transparency in the way that people are judged on their work to make sure that, you know, it is fair and you know, that there's no problems within the assessment itself. For the COE to be attached to HGA, right? The National Guild of Hand Spinners, COE is attached to them. You know, that gives a lot of weight, right? They must know uh, what they're talking about. And I think they do when um, they're evaluating and looking and saying, this is good work, right? Um, I think it just needs to get all on the same page here. Because anybody can make a certification. Anybody can get on the internet and make a course and print out a certification and say, ha ha, you got a certification. It happens all the time and it's not a bad thing. Um, it's nice to get something to say you did this thing and did this work and you know, but like there are participation certificates, right? Like you pay, you do the thing, you get the certificate. And then there's recognition of skill certificates. And those need to have a common understanding of that level of skill and a reputation for being valuable within the community. And I feel like HGA has that reputation and I feel like they have, recog there's recognition for the COE, but I feel like HGA is squandering what they have by letting it languish for 25 years without a revision. And I do think it's important for the community, uh, for the people who invest their time and their money um, in all of this. The COE should be something that recognizes spinners of excellence. And if it is so, tedious, laborious, and it takes the professionals away from doing the things that earn them their money and keep them active in the community. If it takes those people away for such a great amount of time that they say it's not worth it, that also needs to be addressed. Um, because you would want a certification like this to be awarded to all of Anybody who has that skill level should be recognized. HGA's stated mission is to educate, support, and inspire the fiber arts community. And I did not find this process inspiring. I found it grueling. It really burned me out. When I was done with this, I didn't want to spin anything at all. 
And it took a couple months for me to really take a break long enough to get back to wanting to spin again. And that's pretty rough. And I really wonder if there are more people out there who submitted a COE project and uh, didn't pass and kind of stepped away from spinning a little bit. I hope there's not a lot of you out there, but if you are out there and you're watching this and that's your circumstance, go dust off your wheel. Find some fiber that brings you joy and just spin a little bit. Just completing the COE. I know it specifically says in the handbook that completing it and turning it in is not guarantee of getting the certification, but really just completing it is an achievement. It might not be a standard of excellence, uh, however that gets defined, but um, it is an achievement. So I think it is something to be proud of. If you are a person considering doing the COE, I um, would suggest taking a really good look at the handbook and figuring out what kind of um, finances that you have available to do this, what kind of time you have to do this. Do you have support? Like if you have a family, is there someone that could watch the kids a little extra? You know, what's your job like? Because this is a massive amount of work. Hopefully it'll get revised and um, fix that because HGA, has an opportunity to provide that support and education and inspiration to the fiber arts community. They have that opportunity, right? They have the bones of something here. They definitely have the reputation of something here. And I think it could be overhauled and fleshed out and, uh, you know, address the issues of what the common practices are for design, for assessment design and, uh, I really think that there could be something truly beneficial here. Hello, Fiber friends. Welcome back to the COE. It has been a journey. And now this video today is the video that it won't be the last COE video, but I'm at the very end and it, it's interesting. I have a lot of feelings about completing this project. I mean, I can see the finish line. I'm not really over the finish line, but I have a lot of thoughts. I have a lot of feelings, a lot of reflections, and I will put those in a different video. That's not what we're here for today. Today we are going to be spinning. So read the instructions. Don't try to interpret them. Do what they say. The important thing is to follow the directions. Follow, follow the, directions. the directions. We are going to read the directions. Where you have directions, wherever you have directions. Follow the directions. The important thing is to follow the directions. Following the directions. And so just pay attention. Is it even measuring spinning skills or is it measuring organization? And if you don't follow the directions, the judges can't give you credit. The directions. And what do the examiners hope to see in a level one application? Follow the requirements to the letter. I'm amazed sometimes that what seems to me in the handbook to be a very specific instruction for a particular sample and yet the applicant has not grasped what it was all about. So follow the instructions to the letter. Be very particular about that. I think that maybe um, the problem isn't with with us. <laughs> maybe the problem is with the handbook. I think it's important for an applicant to learn to evaluate his or her own work according to the criteria that are listed in the handbook. The criteria seem clear and self-explanatory. The criteria are here, the criteria are in the handbook, but what are the standards? How do you define the standards? And they said the criteria are in the handbook. They basically told me to <laughs> read the handbook, <laughs> follow the directions. Um, there has to be a better way. <laughs> 